Welcome to Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, back again with another episode. This is Rivals 4, y'all. Rivals 4. You know, in the first uh, episode, second episode, and third episode, I hope that I laid the foundation for you to understand a little bit about Chris, and, and I hope that I did justice to it. You know, like I say, I'm reading the letters that he's sending to me and putting the story together as best as I can, and I'm reading the letters at the same time while I'm talking. Uh, but I hope that I'm doing justice to him and this story. And... Uh, this episode, I'm going to be talking about how his relationship with Keisha, the mother of his son, Chris Jr., uh, was formed over those years. Now, keep in mind, Chris is in prison now, serving a life sentence, right, for murder. So, the physical relationship is pretty much done. Um, so, this is starting to play into the dynamics of their relationship because uh, he's not there to provide her with what it is she says she needs uh, in that way. And it's taking a toll on him and her and it's shaping, you know, the dynamics of their relationship and how their relationship uh, would eventually uh, come to an end, right? And how that affects Chris as well. So uh, lean back, relax, enjoy the show and uh, let's get to it. The names, places, and affiliations have been changed to protect the participants' privacy. These are their stories. There's gotta be some way to stop this vicious cycle. Death to all my rivals, death to all my rivals. Success to my affiliates and all my idols. But death to all my rivals, death to all my rivals. There's gotta be some way to stop this vicious cycle. Death to all my rivals, death to all my rivals. Success to my affiliates and all my idols. But death to all my rivals, death to all my rivals. Kill one of ours, we kill one of yours. It's a vicious cycle. Money and drugs up in the mix just keeps the interest heightened. It's on site. So when I catch you, clash up the titans. If I can't shoot you, I'ma fight you. Knuckle up a knife you. Cause in my hood, yo, it's all about survival. Watching my opposition through the crosshairs of a rifle. Dog light, it wasn't enough crap to let the light through. Welcome to doing time with Joe. We'll show about the rivals. Dear Joe, what's up, bro? How you been doing? Uh, I want to be honest with you and tell you the real raw about how me and Keisha uh, ended up going our separate ways. You know, keep in mind, you know, I'm in prison for life now, and uh, a woman needs what a woman needs. I couldn't provide that for her. I tried to convince her to come to visit so we can, you know, sneak off and, and do our thing here and there, right? But she wasn't with that. She wanted me to be there to lay up with her, and I couldn't do that. Uh, and that affected how our relationship ended, right? But let me lay the foundation for you on all of the things that came into play because our relationship ended pretty quick after I got to prison because I couldn't take what was going on and who she was doing it with, Right? And I know a lot of other people go through that, but I'm gonna, let me lay out my story for you about that, right? Uh, you know, when I came to prison, right, it's because, you know, I didn't want to rat on anybody. I didn't want to tell on my charge partners or anything like that, right? So I took the charge for some other, for some of the folks that uh, was on the case with me and these same individuals that said they loved me, said they got my back, said that all of these things that, you know, gangsters say to each other, they ended up being the ones that were going by the house and knocking Keisha off, right? Having sex with her. You know what I'm saying? I'll never forget the one day I called by the house, you know, I'm talking to her about some things. And I told her, I said, I hit my brother up on the three-way. I need to talk to him about some of the business, right? Some uh, GD business, right? And she said, uh, now he's right here. You know what I mean? I'm like, why is he over there, right? And she said, he drops by every now and then. I said, oh, okay. I said, that's what's up. I said, put him on the phone. I said, what's up, bro? He said, what's going on, bro? What's going on with you? And I said, man, let me uh, give you the rundown on what's going on and what I need you to do for me. This, this, and that, right? Uh, so we can take care of the business inside and outside on this GD business, right? He was like, that's what's up, folks. He said, uh, listen to me, man. Uh, you know, I've been dropping by here, uh, you know, making sure the household is taken care of for you, bro. Just looking out for things for, you know, Keisha and, and little Chris, you know what I'm saying? I hope you don't mind it. He, and I was like, nah, I don't mind it at all, bro. I said, uh, I appreciate you doing that. You know what I'm saying? Look out for them for me, man. I would do the same for you. And 
when I said that part, it was like a little laugh. He snickered, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like that, right? And that stuck to me like glue because it was like, it was something about it. It was something about the way he sounded when he laughed like that, right? So anyway, I, I ran down the business with him, told him what I needed and, and where I needed it dropped off so we can take care of the business, right? But I called back over the next day, he's still there. The next day, he's there. The next day, he's there. And I'm starting to wonder, is he ever leaving? You know what I'm saying? Look, Chris is too small to talk to in that way, right? You know what I'm saying? And he calls him unk. But again, he don't really know what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Not no grown folk business. And he couldn't tell me nothing about that, right? And I didn't dare ask him. I didn't want to put him in the middle of that as young as he was. So one day I was just in one of them moves, right? I've been up in here smoking and drinking and all this and that, right? So I just asked Keisha. I said, what's going on with you and bro? And she said, I don't, don't start tripping like that. He just drops by and, you know, make sure we got money and food and stuff like that. Help pay the bills and all this and that. I said, all of that's cool, right? I said, but uh, what you doing for him for all of that? And she said, quit acting like a little boy. You know what it is. I'm like, oh, so it's like that. And she's like, yeah, it's like that. You ain't here. You ain't here. I'm answering all your phone calls. I'm putting money on your books. I'm making sure you get your drugs and all this other kind of stuff. And you worrying about who I'm getting dick from. I'm like, ah, there it is. There it is. So I throw me off. I was like, well, dig that. I said, I tell you what, uh, you don't worry about taking a phone call no more, but make sure I continue to get that pack. You know what I'm saying? And, we'll, and when I do call, it'll just be about the business. You do what you want to do. She said, all right then. You know what I'm saying? And she said, well, what about little Chris? I said, I'll talk to him. I don't need to talk to you. She was, <laughs> she acted like she was real with it. She was like, all right then. That's straight. Hung the phone up. As time goes on, you know, I'm starting to call over there, you know, to talk to little Chris to check on the pack, this, this, and that. You know, and I'm hearing stuff in the background. All kind of voices and this and that and that and this. Now, keep in mind, I'm done with her, but my heart's still with her. I'm hearing all kind of noise in the background. They partying and kicking it, this, 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 and that. And now the packs is coming slower. She's not accepting the phone calls as often. Even though uh, she wasn't paying for them, I'm paying for them. Things was changing. She was changing. Even though I said, okay, I'm cool with it, but like I said, my heart was still there. And what was going on, I just couldn't bear it. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to fast forward. You know, years are passing. My little boy's getting older. He might be still a kid, but he can hear now and understand what's you know, he could he could hear and understand what was going on in a bedroom. You know what I mean? He hearing his mama in the back getting smashed by dude after dude after dude. You know what I'm saying? He understands what's going on. He see all these different dudes. But the one thing that got me was these dudes is running by there and smashing on Keisha. These is brothers that say they with me. These is brothers that say they with me. A couple of them is the brothers that I took this charge for. Threw my life away. And that's something that I'm coming to realize now. I threw my life away for an, an idea that was empty, no substance whatsoever. Because I thought I was doing what you're supposed to do, keep it thorough. Doing what my daddy told me, keep your mouth shut when it comes to the police. But... In doing that, I lost my son. I lost my gal. Now, if you want to get all the way deep into it, I took a life because I believed in this bull crap lifestyle. And it cost me everything. And the people that I had around me started to reveal themselves to me. Oh, yeah, they wore the same colors that I wore. They used the same language that I used. But as soon as I was gone, they're laying in the bed with my gal while my son is in the house. 
he calling them unk. But he's hearing them in the back knocking Keisha down, sexing her up. Now, how do you think that was affecting him? Well, I'm going to tell you how, bro. He started to look at his mama like she was nothing. Right? I got fortunate enough, man, to come up, man, with another female, right? And uh, I got I convinced Keisha I had to pay her to let her bring my son to see me. So when my new gal started coming to see me, she bringing my son up there. I'm seeing it on his face. He can't handle what's going on. He said, I don't want to be with mama no more. I don't want to live there no more. How come I can't live with your new girlfriend? I told him it don't work like that. I just can't take you away from your mama. You know what I'm saying? And then he was about, at this time, he was about seven. He's about seven years old, right? It's the first time I ever heard him refer to his mama in a bad way. My son called his own mama a hoe. He said she running in, let dudes running in and out of the house, knocking her down. Now, keep in mind, he's seven years old, right? He's seven years old, and he's understanding what's going on in a way that a seven-year-old should not be aware of. He's sleeping on the couch in the living room while she's in the back having sex, and he's hearing those sounds. He's describing to me what that sounds like. And he said he can't take it no more. He's starting to hate his mama. I couldn't help but feel the blame because I sacrificed my relationship with him. I sacrificed my role as a father to him for an idea that meant that taking a life was nothing as long as it was about the business. I sacrificed that for my son. And in the end, now my son is suffering. But I gotta watch that. I'm still trying to play that role. It's gonna be all right. I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna talk to Keisha, I'm gonna see if she can let you spend the night over old gal's house, all right? But keep in mind, he's watching me get a pack from her, right? So he's still seeing file on top of file. I get the pack from her, hand it off to my mule, and then my mule takes it back to the unit. He's seeing all of this. And as he's getting older, he's learning the game, whether I'm telling him or not. He's peeping the game. What he's learning from his mama out there what he's learning from me in the streets. I mean, in the penitentiary. All of that was molding him. Shaping the way he would one day see the world. But again, I can't help but feel to blame for that. I did this. I sacrificed everything out of selfishness, and now he's the one suffering. So when my son became a teenager, well, he's about 12, he went, you know, 11 or 12 years old at that time, him and his mama moved to the other side of town, right? Now, on this side of town, ain't number bloods and vice lords. Now, just because they moved on another side of town, don't mean that uh, Keisha ain't still doing what she do. Now, instead of her uh, letting gangsters run up and down in her, she's letting the Bloods and the Vice Lords run up and down in her. But it was one big difference. It was one big difference. One of the guys that's on the, that, that was a Vice Lord, he starts to develop feelings for Keisha. And he put locks on them. Ain't nobody else coming over to the house but him. 
He's coming by there every night, playing daddy role, spending time with my son, doing the things that I couldn't do. He wasn't mistreating Keisha no more. She wasn't out doing what she was doing. He took care of everything. He get money. He hustling in the streets. She ain't got to lay on her back no more. Right? To her, she could come up. To my son, he got what he always wanted. Right? Somebody in his life that's permanent, that's there. Don't forget about, you know what I'm saying, him hustling and all of this and that. That's relevant. But to my son, what's more relevant is that he's there. He's there. And he's doing right by him as far as you can for somebody that sells drugs. He makes sure he has food, clothing, roof over his head, helps him with his homework. He's doing all of this, right? And he's also teaching him the business as far as how vice lords see it, right? He's also planting those seeds in my son to hate me. After a while, Keisha wouldn't let her, she wouldn't let my girlfriend bring him to see me no more. So I had to call over there and talk to this vice lord. I had to beg this man to let my son come see me. He puts me on the phone with my son. He said, it's up to him if he wants to come see you. I asked him, you want to come see me? He said, yeah, I still want to come and see you, daddy. And I could hear it in his voice. He was he was conflicted. He really didn't know what he wanted to do. He he didn't want to uh, hurt the people. This man that he had grown close to, he didn't want to uh, hurt me. So I told him, I said, look, I don't want to hurt you anymore. If you really don't want to come see me, because you think it'll be a problem, you don't have to. I could hear him crying. He was trying to hold it in, but I could hear him crying. And then I heard dude in the background. He said, little nigga, we don't do no crying in this house. And just as quick as that, he stopped. I ain't never felt so small in my life. I ain't never felt so small in my life. Here's another man. He's got more influence over my son than me. My son respect this man so much that he won't even cry if that man say stop crying. I felt like my son wasn't my son no more. I felt like this is it. So I told my son, I said, I love you. And if you want to come see me, call Gail, you got the number. And you let her know she's going to bring you up here. Whenever she comes to visit me, she'll bring you. One year goes by, two years go by, three years go by. No visit. I get a letter in the mail talking about my son is in juvie. He got locked up, stealing some cars or some old, something like that. But the part of the letter that really hit me, and keep in mind, this letter came from Keisha too, right? The dude done got on down on her, right? She by herself. But she's still tricking, you know what I mean? But she wrote me this letter and said that my son was a vice lord. Now, Keisha know my story. She know who killed my moms and pops. She know where my heart's at when it comes to that. I don't know if she told me that to warn me or to hurt me. 
it still had the same effect. So, when I balled the letter up and I threw it in the toilet, flushed it, I felt like I, I felt like I had severed the ties with my son. I chose the life, GD, over my son. I couldn't see how reckless that was. I was blinded by the anger and the rage that I had for those individuals because of what they did to my parents. I didn't realize all of the things that that decision would lead to. I didn't understand a lot of it. I'm angry with these people because they killed my parents, even though my parents were on their way over there to kill them, even though my parents had killed many people, hurt many people. I still saw them in a way that any other child would see their parents. I didn't see the monster that they were. I didn't. I was afraid of my pops because I didn't understand a lot. But over the years, I've come to understand him more so now than then. He was doing what he thought was best. And I did not want to do anything to dishonor him, even if it meant my son had to go if it came down to it. That's how distorted my mind was. That's how distorted you get when you think about the lifestyle and you look through that lens of that lifestyle. Nothing else matters, not even the blood. This is my child. And I had chose GD over him. Look here, y'all. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to pick this back up in the next episode of Rivals. I hope that you're enjoying it. I hope that you're learning. I hope you're following along with what's going on. I'm telling you now, this life is treacherous, right? And it's going to get a little bit more treacherous. Just keep listening, keep following. Share these episodes with your friends and family. This is real stuff that's going on here, right? This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all. Critical thinking if you hustling the banking, harder ain't smarter. Suck, yelling and argue, made me carve you with a carbon. Humbling giants, 50 bananas going to find you. No IG beefing, street sweeping, I come with reapers. Fuck your people, fuck the judge, you want to ride this how you thug. I wake up, wash my face with blood, back to dancing in mud. I read the scripture with this phone, nigga. Be damn if I get blamed by a whole nigga. And I see the whole picture, cross it from niggas who roll with you. Now with this honey, you a big